All right, this is Personal Evangelism class number two, and the title of this lesson is The Promises of the Great Commission. Uh, the last time we talked about the um, imperatives of the Great Commission or the commandments of the Great Commission. What I'm doing in these first two classes is basically talking about the person who is supposed to go out and exercise personal evangelism, the person who is supposed to be a soul winner. And I might return to this idea other times in the class. Uh, starting next week, I plan on getting into what is the gospel and what is not the gospel. Uh, but right now, I want to talk to, to you gentlemen uh, who are watching this or anyone else who might be watching uh, and talk about the kind of person you are and the promises the Lord gave to us um, when He gave the Great Commission, he, he gave the commandment for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. In most of those uh, commandments, He also gave promises, or at least uh, the promises were connected in other portions of Scripture uh, that were very close uh, to the Great Commission. So. Uh, the idea is, before Christ left, He gave us promises that we can claim and we can use uh, when we are trying to do His work. All right, so we're going to start with Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Uh, and Jesus came and spake to them, uh, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Okay, so Christ says all power, which could also be translated authority, all power or authority, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So that covers the entire universe. And Christ says, at this time in the plan of God, all power, all authority resides in Him. He has all the power. He has all the authority. And because of that, because He has the authority and the power, He says, go ye therefore. Okay, so based on him possessing the authority, because he has all power and authority, you and I are commanded to go. Okay, so go ye therefore. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay, so because he has the authority, he's passing some of that on to us and saying that you are to go in my stead. You are to go in my place. You are to go as representatives of me. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, be ye reconciled to God. So that is our job. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ to lost people. We tell them about Christ, and in Christ's place, we beg them to come to the Lord. We beg them to come to Christ and be saved. So we go as His representatives, as His ambassadors, bearing His authority. Okay, we don't have great authority, but we have what Christ has given to us. And so we go in His name, we go in His authority. Um, because Christ is the, is the Lord of the universe. He's the creator of all things. He is almighty God. No one has the right to hinder or to stop us in spreading the gospel of Christ. Now we know from church history and from the, the present day that there are many people who believe that they do have the right, they do have the authority or the power to stop us from spreading the gospel. It may be people from a different religion. It might be 
bureaucrats and legislators and governors and whatever who are trying to stop us from spreading the gospel uh, in America during this uh, you know, pandemic. We hear that all the time. Um, there are some states that have been very strict on allowing churches to gather and they have sometimes shut them down entirely, sometimes uh, a certain percentage of their capacity can attend and things of that nature and of course you have to wear a mask and now you have to be vaccinated and all of this. Um, I really think the apostles would have had a hard time uh, with those restrictions and would have said we ought to obey God rather than men. Um, but anyway, um, not trying to get into politics or our health matters, but Christ has given us authority and told us what to do. And then he says at the end, here's another promise, uh, he says, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Okay, so we are to go in his name, bearing his authority, having the right to preach the gospel because Christ has told us to. And then there's a promise at the end that he is with us always. He says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Okay, until the consummation, he is with us. So as we go, whether it's preaching in church or perhaps gathering a crowd in a village or one-on-one -on -one to a family member or a neighbor or a co-worker or something of, of that nature. Whenever you are doing the work of Christ, He is there with you. Okay, He is, is accompanying you uh, as we evangelize, as we baptize, as we teach. He is there. Uh, he's not hindered by time or distance. Okay, not hindered at all. There's nothing that can, can hinder the Lord Jesus. And as we go to do his work, he empowers us for the work of the ministry. We can serve him because he is alive and he is with us. Uh, just think of circumstances that Christian people meet um, when they go out to do the work of the Lord. And uh, I've been to India several times, and um, I know that uh, there have been instances of persecution. They are, are fairly common. They seem to have grown uh, in frequency in the last, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, it seems, something like that. Now, that's just my opinion. I may be wrong, but that's what it seems to me that that persecution is becoming more common, at least in some parts of India. And uh, you go out and you, and you witness, uh, you preach, you go to evangelize a village, and um, you face opposition sometimes, maybe most of the time. You face opposition, there are people who are extreme in their beliefs and don't want to hear anything about Jesus and don't want their their village evangelized. And so they withstand you. Well, in that situation, however serious it may become, Christ is there with you. And because of these things, because of his presence, when we face these things, we can be strong. We can be faithful. We can be bold and courageous. And of course, we see plenty of examples of that in the scripture, uh, especially in the book of Acts, where Paul and Peter and others uh, stood up and uh, told the truth in Christ, uh, even though they were sometimes facing situations that could cost their lives. And we know, of course, that uh, most of the, the apostles of the early church were martyred. Uh, so the presence of Christ, our fellowship with him, uh, encourages us 
sustains us, empowers us for the work of the ministry. Uh, that knowledge that the Lord is with us, the one who died for us and rose again, is with us as we go out. Uh, that is a tremendous encouragement to us. Um, oh, let me think. Hebrews chapter 12. Let me turn over to that and make sure I, I get it right. I don't know about you all. I, I presume that most of you who are watching this are, are young men. And I have reached an age where a lot of verses that I once knew by heart um, get a little jumbled up in my head sometimes. And it's better to read them than to try to quote them. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Okay, so he, he's given us a job to do. He's given us a race to run. And he says that we need to lay aside the weights and the sin which easily besets us. Okay, we all have a wicked, rotten, old nature that wants to lead us into sin. And sin easily besets us. We need to realize that and be on guard for it. And let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. Then he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay? Run the race with endurance, looking unto Jesus. Okay, looking unto Jesus, the perfect example, and the one who is our constant companion as we are doing the work of the Lord. He has promised he is always with us. Okay, that's a marvelous, marvelous thing. And then he says, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. If you ever feel like giving up, if you ever feel like I've had it, I can't do this any longer, look at Christ and remember, consider what he went through so that you and me can be saved. Okay? Now that's a wonderful, wonderful thing and we need to remember those things. Okay, so now that was the first one. Uh, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, uh, his promise of authority and presence, the presence of Christ with us. Now let's go over to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, another great promise given by Christ shortly before his ascension to heaven. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Okay, so the promise here is ye shall receive power. And then he says, as a result of that power, ye shall be witnesses unto me even to the ends of the, of the, of the world. Okay? even to the ends of the earth, to, to every person out there that needs to hear. Okay, so ye shall receive power. Uh, the Holy Spirit will come. Okay, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So the Holy Spirit was promised that he would come. We're going to look at some more verses in the Gospel of John about the promise of the Spirit coming. Okay, but the Spirit of God was going to come, and He's going to give us power to be witnesses. Okay, the power of the Holy Spirit extends to other areas of our life and ministry as well, but here He's specifically saying that He wants us to be witnesses to the uttermost part of the earth, and that He is going to give us the power to do that. Okay, very, very important. Um, Let's go to John chapter 14. Okay, John chapter 14. 
and uh, verse 16 and 17. Okay, Christ says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Okay, the next verse he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Um, so he says, I'm going to give you another comforter, and he will abide with you forever. Okay, in verse 16. And he calls him in verse 17, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Okay, a, a lost man cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, only saved people have the Holy Spirit, and all saved people have the Holy Spirit. And he says, ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. So the Holy Spirit at this time lives within the bodies of every single believer. He is in us, and he says he will be with us forever. We have the Holy Spirit forever. He will never, ever leave us. Okay, so this is a marvelous thing that he, he has done. Uh, the Holy Spirit has many ministries in this age. He indwells us. He seals us, okay, which a seal was a, a mark, uh, like to, to close a document, or they sealed Christ's tomb, and they used different things. Sometimes it was wax, and they would stamp a signet in it, signifying uh, whose authority is behind that seal. Uh, in Christ's uh, tomb, it was probably a string with a couple of pieces of clay which were stuck one to the wall and one to the stone uh, so that if it was rolled away, if anybody moved it, it would break the seal and you would know that someone had violated that seal. And in the lumps of clay, which are called bulla, uh, they would stamp the signet of the person with the authority to close it. All right, so uh, he is our seal, guaranteeing our salvation. He's also the earnest of our inheritance, which is another form of a guarantee. Okay, he has been given to us, he indwells us, he lives within us as the guarantee that we are going to get all of redemption. Uh, we've been saved, we are saved, we're going to heaven, the Spirit of God lives within us, there's many wonderful things, but we don't have the whole thing right now. Okay, someday we're going to be in heaven with no sin, with perfect righteousness, with no bad health, with no miseries of any kind. It's going to be marvelous, and so we have that to look forward to. So he's the guarantee of all these things. Now he teaches us, as you study the Word of God on a, a regular basis, as you meditate and pray over the Scripture, the Holy Spirit teaches it to you. And uh, He's the greatest teacher, of course, of all. Um, as far as the Great Commission is concerned, He empowers us and convicts the world. Okay, we see the, the empowering uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is going to come. He has come now for us, but Christ promised he would come, and he would give us power, and also he would convict the world. Uh, which we will look at that in, in greater depth in just a couple of minutes. Um, the Holy Spirit will lead us in our ministry as he did the Apostle Paul. Now, I don't think in, in our time we would expect to hear a voice speak to us and say, don't go here, don't go there, instead go over here. Okay, the Apostle Paul was led in that fashion. Uh, he was, was told, don't go to Asia, don't go to Mycenae, don't go to Bithynia, okay? Instead, go to Macedonia, okay? So 
we would expect that as we go about our ministry and we have choices to make, do I go over here and preach or do I go over there and preach? Uh, do I, I go to this church? Do I go to that church? What do I do? Okay, we would expect the Holy Spirit to work, be working in our lives, in our circumstances, uh, through the advice of godly people and so on, to be leading us as he led people uh, in the first century. Now, um, let, me, let me ask you this, and this came to mind as I was studying this. Uh, did God not want Asia, for instance, to hear the gospel? He told Paul, don't go to Asia. Okay, instead go to Macedonia. Was that because God didn't love the people of Asia and didn't want them to hear the gospel? Well, of course not. God loves everyone and wants everyone to hear the gospel. He has commanded us, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, obviously, as individuals, we cannot by ourselves fulfill the Great Commission, but we can fulfill our part in it. So God told Paul, don't go over here. Was that because he didn't want them to be saved? Of course not. Instead, he sent other people there. If you look at the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation written at the end of the first century, guess what? They're all in Asia. Okay? They're all in Asia. Somebody went there and preached the gospel. Probably several people were sent by God to that area to preach the gospel. And they did it faithfully and planted quite a number of churches. Okay, so God loves everybody. He wants everybody to be saved. But he has a specific will for your life and my life. Okay, and he might send one person uh, to Bithynia and not another. And uh, all those areas were reached uh, for Christ early. Uh, in, uh, in the church history. Okay, um, a number of the things that we're looking at and we will be looking at within the next few minutes are still another aspect of the power of God that is bestowed upon us for the purpose of winning souls to Christ. Okay, and the truth is you and I need help. Okay, this, this is an undertaking that is beyond us. It's not simply a matter of how much we know, of how, let's say, healthy we are, how intelligent we are, how dedicated we are, how hardworking we are. Um, this task of reaching people for Christ and winning them to the Lord whether it's your next door neighbor or somebody 10,000 miles away on the other side of the world. Okay, this job is too big for us. We cannot do it and we need help. Now, Christ has said, he says in Acts chapter 14, and again, uh, he says in Acts chapter 16, um, verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. So again, he calls the Holy Spirit the Comforter. Well, this is a word in the Greek language, parakletos. Uh, oftentimes, preachers or theologians will call it a paraclete. The Holy Spirit is our paraclete. It's a very simple word. It means someone who has been called. Kaleo, a verb, means to call. Okay, para means like, come here. Okay, so a paraclete is someone who is called alongside to help. Um, just about everybody, sometime or other, has been in a situation where you need to pick something up, let's say, and move it from here to there and it is too heavy for you, or it is too bulky for you to handle on your own. And so you go to a friend and you say, would you come over here and help me? You call him over to help. Okay, so a paraclete, which is comforter, the name for the Holy Spirit, 
is one called alongside to help. Christ sent him to be our helper, and we desperately need his help. Convincing lost people to trust Christ as Savior is beyond our ability. Reaching an entire world that is now close to 8 billion people that is a mind-boggling job. It is well beyond what we're capable of. But with God's help, with the Spirit of God who lives within every one of us, this job can be done. Okay, so uh, in John chapter 16, we read verse 7. Let's read uh, verse 8 through 11. And when he has come, that's the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Okay, so um, Christ has sent the Comforter, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, and part of his job, and again, this is part of the enabling aspect of the Spirit's ministry. This is part of his power, where we don't have the power to make things clear and plain to a lost mind. The Holy Spirit does, okay? Um, he has come, the word convict means to persuade or to convince, to expose the truth to a person's understanding so that they can get it, so that they can comprehend what you're telling them, okay? And this is done as you and I preach the gospel, as we talk to a neighbor, as we pass out a tract and, and talk to someone, as we might stand in a public square and witness to people that are there. Um, the Holy Spirit works with us in the hearts and minds of these people that we're witnessing to, to convince them of the truth of the gospel. Okay, um, the Calvinist, and every now and then perhaps in this class I'll refer to Calvinism, which let me just say real quickly right off the bat, and I don't know what you think, I hope you're in agreement with me, but uh, people talk about five points of Calvinism I'm not going to go into detail right now, but let me just say uh, I don't believe a single one of the five points of Calvinism. A couple of them seem kind of almost like what the Bible teaches, but not quite. Close, but when you're talking about the doctrine of the Word of God, close doesn't make it. Okay, close is not good enough. Well, the Calvinist says that the lost cannot understand the gospel until God sovereignly regenerates them and gives them the gift of faith. Okay, now, what is regenerate? Regeneration means to be born again. Okay, so they cannot, according to the Calvinist, the lost person cannot understand the gospel until... God regenerates him. He causes him to be born again, and he gives him the gift of faith so that they can believe, because they cannot believe unless God sovereignly gives them the faith. Okay, so this means that lost people, God, just without, you know, just his own decision, he makes them born again and gives them faith so that they are saved before they believe. Now, have you ever seen a scripture that says that? I haven't. There's not a single scripture in the entire Bible that says that God makes people saved and then they believe the gospel. Everything I've ever seen says it's the other way around. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay? Well, how can they believe until they understand it? And God sent 
the Holy Spirit to the earth to help lost people understand the gospel. Okay? This idea that, that they cannot possibly believe until God performs some sovereign miracle and opens their minds and they're born again and then they have faith, it's, it's crazy. It's nonsense. Okay? The truth is, God helps them to understand. God helps them to believe. Uh, he persuades them concerning three things. He says, of sin, because they believe not on me. Okay, this, and we're seeing here some things that people need to understand when we give them the gospel. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Romans 3.23 is one of our favorite verses to use in witnessing to people, whether it's to a, a large crowd or uh, whether it's one person at a time. Uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. People need to understand that they're sinners. And the Holy Spirit will convince them. He will convict them that they are sinners. Okay, now he says... Okay, of sin, because they believe not on me. Okay, why does he say it that way? Well, let's look over. There's a couple of verses I want to look at. First of all, in fact, it may be on the same page in your Bible. Um, John chapter 15, verse 22 to 24, Jesus says, If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them, among them pardon me, the works which no other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. Okay, Christ is saying that the life he lived and the deeds that he performed showed them to be sinners. Okay, he proved the sinfulness of man by his own spotless life, his own righteous life, and the fact that he did things that nobody could do but God himself. He performed miracles that they had absolutely no explanation for. There was no way except for the fact that he was God. Okay, so he exposed their sin. He made their sin obvious to them. Now, let's go over to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and this is a very important verse. Verse 24. So John 8, 24. I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Okay, beloved, we have trusted Christ as our Savior. We believe in the Lord Jesus. So when we die, we do not die in our sins. But lost people who don't believe in Christ, when they die, they die in their sins, and they stand before God as condemned sinners. Okay, now I want to point out something to you. You notice it says there, for if you believe not that I am he, and I'm reading from a King James Bible, which is the one I always use, but you might notice the word he, a little prep, uh, pronoun there, is in italics, which means it's not in the original. And I looked this up to make sure I was correct. Um, go over, probably need to turn a page or so, uh, to John chapter 8 and verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Okay, because of their sin, they're in great danger. And only faith in Christ can deliver them. If they don't believe in Christ, they die in their sin. If they do believe in Christ, they do not die in their sin. So he is the only way of salvation. Now in both of these uh, passages in the English, he says, I am. Well, in the Greek, they're exactly identical. 
in the Greek, the original language, the, the words are ego ami, ego ami, the same exact words in John 8, 24 and John 8, 58. He is saying he is the I am, the self-existent one. He told Moses in the desert, I am that I am. Tell them I am has sent you. Okay? When Christ says, I am, he's making it clear to these folks that he is claiming to be God himself. Okay, he's not just a man. He is a man. As God, he could not die. As the God-man, God and man, he could die. And he came to die. If Jesus had not been born of the virgin and become a man, he could never have died for our sins. Okay, so it's important that we realize Jesus is saying, I am the great I am. And at the end of this chapter, they understood it because after he said, before Abraham was, I am, then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. Okay, they understood he was claiming to be God. Well, I think this is showing us again something when we preach we need to emphasize. Who is Jesus? Okay, we're asking people to believe in someone who lived and died almost 2,000 years ago. Well, who is that one in whose name we preach? He is God who left his throne in heaven, came to the earth born as a baby, laid in a manger, born of a virgin, okay, lived a perfect spotless life on this earth for about 30 to 33 years, something like that, went to the cross, not simply because Pilate was a corrupt politician, a spineless one like so many politicians. No, he went to the cross so that he could die and pay for our sins and satisfy the holiness and the righteousness and the justice of God Almighty. Okay? He went there for us and then he was buried and then rose from the dead and he's alive and because he's alive he can save anyone who will come to God by him. Alright? So very, very important and when we preach the gospel they have to understand who he is. Over there in in India, I've been told, and I don't know if this is a fact or not, I don't consider myself an expert on Hinduism by any means, uh, but I've been told there's 30 million gods in Hinduism. I've heard even way beyond that. Uh, I heard someone fairly recently say 300 million gods, and I don't know if that's a fact or not. But I know they believe in a lot of gods. Well, when a, when a Hindu person trust Christ as Savior, they have to understand that this Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God of the Bible, is the one God, the only God, not something that you just add on to the other millions. You know, so now you've got 30 million and one. No, no, no. When they trust Christ, they have to understand they're trusting the true God, the real God, and that's Jesus Christ. Okay, um, so Jesus is the I am, and you have to believe in him, and the Holy Spirit convicts people of their sin because they don't believe in Christ, okay? And Christ is the only way to take away their sin debt. Then he says, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Well, the gospel reveals God's righteousness. Um, we're all familiar with Romans 1.16. Most people uh, who love the Lord have, have memorized that verse, and it's a very precious verse to us. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But then he says something that is kind of overlooked a lot of times. For therein, in the gospel, 
is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, why does it say the righteousness of God is revealed? Okay, well in a nutshell it's because God is righteous, He's holy, He hates sin, man has no righteousness, and so God offers His own righteousness for salvation. Okay? It's, the gospel is such a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, we have nothing to offer God. And so Christ, the Son of God, took our sin debt took it away, paid for it, and now extends to us His righteousness so that we can go to heaven. Um, man has no righteousness and cannot be justified by his own goodness. Let's go to Romans chapter 3, and I'm going to read a few verses here that I'm mostly not going to comment on. But Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. Um, let's skip down to uh, verse 19. Uh, just to save some time. Now we know that what so, things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Okay, man has no righteousness. The law of God was not given to save sinners. It was given to prove that every man is a sinner. Okay, that's the whole point of the law of Moses, to show that you and I are sinners worthy of hell, facing the judgment of God. Okay, then he goes on, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. To be justified means to be declared righteous. It's like you stand before the judge and the judge says you're not guilty. Okay, you're not guilty. Uh, to be justified. Well, the law will not justify us, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ to all and upon all that believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay? He gives us His righteousness as our way to heaven because He took our sin. Okay? Uh, we're justified freely by His grace through the sacrifice of Christ. He shed His blood for us. Um, one more verse, and then we're going to have to end this uh, for time's sake. But verse 28, Romans chapter 3, verse 28, this is extremely important. Okay? Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Okay, man is justified by faith. And God says, this is the conclusion. This isn't my conclusion. God wrote the Bible. And God says, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Can you work your way to heaven? No. Can you help work your way to heaven? No. Can you do anything? besides believe, to gain heaven. The conclusion is no. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith. Not faith plus, not faith and. Okay, it's not faith and good works, it's not faith and baptism, it's not faith and anything. By faith, notice, without. Without the deeds of the law. You cannot add anything to faith and be saved. Okay, faith alone is the way of, of salvation. And we're going to have to stop there and we'll pick up there next week, or the, the, the next class. Thank you.